It's very good to see some familiar faces here, students and colleagues, but it's also very good to see, if you will, some unfamiliar faces because in the 16 years I've lived in New Zealand, I have never seen the level of international interest in an election as there is in this one. And the first thing I want to say tonight is obviously these are some ideas and thoughts about a process that is in motion. If we've learned one thing about this from this election, it's that the rule book seems to be being shredded. I remember sitting in my parents' house in 2015 over the holidays, and all of the pundits, including the pundits on Fox News, said about Donald Trump, he'll be gone by Super Tuesday. <laughs> this can't possibly be serious. Look at the strengths with which Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio or even Ted Cruz are coming into this contest. And here we are with Donald Trump as the Republican nominee. We also know that the Democratic National Convention is this week, and there's some interesting things I want to comment on with respect to the Clinton-Sanders divide. So, with the proviso that these, by definition, have to be provisional, I do have some thoughts I want to share with you. But first, I'm going to start with an anecdote, which actually is relevant to what I'm about to say. That is me about 18 years ago, and I'm not going to tell you how many pounds ago, um, meeting Bill Clinton at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And that was a memorable evening for obvious reasons. And it was also memorable, even were he not one of our most charismatic presidents, it was a memorable evening because that event happened at Urbana-Champaign the day after the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke. <laughs> And it was fascinating to watch one of our best politicians, certainly one of the most talented politicians of his generation. He seemed exhausted when he came in to the room. And everybody had to give their speeches. And then the president got up to give his talk. And the outpouring of support from that college audience, he looked at least 10 years younger at the end of the speech compared to when he started the speech. <laughs> And the Monica Lewinsky scandal, it was a big deal, but relative to where we are today, it almost looks anodyne, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like such an innocent time. So the reason I think this is relevant, though, is when I worked on Capitol Hill, it was in the mid-1990s. I took a test once that put me right in the center of the square with the exact same political opinions that Bill Clinton had which means today that probably puts me to the center right in the United States. Things have changed so much. And again, the rule book, you'll probably hear me say that more than once tonight, is being shredded. I do think Americans love their elections. They love to hype them. They love to talk about them. They love to fight over them. They love to spend money on them. Even with all of that taken into account, I do think that this is a generational defining. I think we are kind of standing, if you will, at a crossroads. And the choice between Trump and Clinton is obviously quite stark. In the 90s, you would hear things like Bill Clinton, Bob Dole, oh, OK, at the margins. But there was a consensus. There was a consensus on American foreign policy. There was a consensus about the free market. There was a consensus on how the United States was supposed to basically operate. And it seems that all of that now is under a very great strain. And as I said to my students who took American government in the first semester here, a lot about this election, to me, as someone who's kind of a 90s person, looks very strange. But it also looks very interesting, and it looks very <coughs> important. Now, going from me and Bill Clinton to John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, uh, perhaps a bit more serious. I'm sure many of you recognize this image. It's, of course, taken from the first televised presidential debate in the United States between Richard Nixon and John Kennedy. And the reason I bring that up, that was a very hard-fought election. You were at the height of the Cold War. You had two very good candidates. I know Nixon, in retrospect, has been tarnished. But as a candidate in 1960, he was favored. That election came down to 
one-tenth of one percent of the popular vote. So it was also a very hard-fought, generation-shifting type of election. But I was preparing for an American government lecture, and I looked back at about eight minutes of that debate, and at the risk of sounding sentimental for one brief moment, I almost started crying about a lost America. You can see there's a very simple stage. <coughs> the two candidates, it's not all the pomp and the circumstance and the hype. And at one point, Richard Nixon, to give him some credit, actually says, now I agree with Senator Kennedy on points one, two, and three that he just made, but now on point four, we have some differences. I thought, where did that go? <laughs> where did that America go? Because regardless of one's partisan point of view, don't mean to be crude, but didn't we have a moment in the Republican primaries when they were basically talking about the relative size of their packages and how that would relate to their ability to govern? I think we did. It was not a good moment. So again, kind of starting, I, it is interesting to think how far away we are from this time, even though, again, this was a very ideologically driven, very hard fought election. So that's where I want to begin then, and I want to do basically three things. Tonight, we're going to look at the candidates and the state of America's political parties. I do want to talk about some possible scenarios about how November 8th may play out, and I do think it's going to be a very long night. <coughs> And then we will conclude with the foreign policy implications, with particular reference to this region, to the United States, and New Zealand. Okay. <coughs> there he is. <laughs> it's a cultural trope that I've noticed even more so than I noticed with Sarah Palin, doesn't translate all that well in New Zealand. Right, the politically incorrect, brash New Yorker. I'm not saying that all Americans like the type, but it is a bit more familiar. And again, I think it is past time to start thinking and taking Donald Trump quite seriously. Because as you will see with some of the numbers that I'm going to put up here, this race is tightening. And I personally expect, though I'm very cautious about making predictions, given that this election has been so volatile, I think there are several different possible scenarios. And I think in any case, it is going to be incredibly hard fought. I think the person who wins is going to have to win it fairly hard, if you will. And I'm not sure how much of a honeymoon either one of them would get. There's usually that magic moment on the inaugural where no matter who you voted for, Americans like to come together in that glow of a new president. And it's before you've got those before and after pictures where they look like they've aged like 40 years, <laughs> right, and their two terms in office. And there is, so there's that moment, and there certainly was for Barack Obama. I'm trying to imagine, given the passions with which people are approaching this election, both abroad and certainly in the United States, and the deeply, intensely felt support or disdain they have for one or the other candidate. I'm not sure that the person coming in is going to have much of a honeymoon at all. I do think some of the changes that we are seeing, again, it's a process in motion. I think this election will tell us a lot about the way America is tracking. But I think it will continue. I think a lot of the tensions that have been brought to the forefront with this election are going to continue, and I think whoever wins is facing a very difficult first four years. So going back to Trump, he was sort of the clown of the primaries there for a while, but we do need to remember he defeated 16 Republican primary rivals. He, metaphorically speaking, took down Jeb Bush. The Bush family dynasty goes back farther than the Kennedy dynasty goes. It has been described by historians as the single most successful political family in American history. 
And I don't know how many of you actually watched the primaries, but I thought that Jeb Bush, for all his formidable political talent, looked absolutely gobsmacked at some of the things that Trump would come out with. I don't think he had a clue how to deal with the types of things that Trump would say, the fact that Trump is clearly not playing by the Republican Party rule book. Marco Rubio, rising star, the face of the new, more liberal, younger Republican Party, defeated him. Ted Cruz <coughs> defeated him, the star of the Tea Party. So we need to remember, Trump did defeat 16 Republican rivals. He won 37 states. He crossed the delegate threshold, so he is clearly the nominee. And while there's been a lot of media focus on the working class white male voter, which is a core part of Trump's constituency, it certainly is. But as you see here, his coalition spanned quite a bit of the Republican spectrum. And as Trump himself has pointed out, and this is a point I want to return to, it's called the Republican Party. It's not called the Conservative Party. And I do think there's a bit of wisdom there. The thing about Trump, which is making so many people nervous and is part of the reason that so many Republicans are claiming publicly that they're either not going to vote, they're going to find a third candidate, or they're going to vote for Hillary Clinton. He didn't come up through the party structure. He is an elite in the sense that he's a very wealthy man. He's not a political elite in the way that Washington, D.C. would understand it. He does not have to have loyalty to the Republican Party. He has not used their platform. He's not used their funding. And so I think it's going to be very interesting to watch with Trump the long-term effect on the Republican Party. In some ways, I think Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, who is trying to be the face of the new Republican Party, will have an easier time of it if Hillary Clinton wins. Because then she can clearly be put on defense, <coughs> and you just keep building the new Republican Party, moving it into the 21st century, trying to get away from some of the identity politics and the social issues that have kept the Republican Party very unpopular <coughs> with some constitu constituencies, particularly younger people. On the other hand, if Donald Trump wins, the Republican Party as we know it is probably going to have to change. It will have to morph into some other entity. Trump is not a fan of free trade agreements, not a fan of the Republican establishment. Most Republicans support a fairly high amount of immigration because they relate it to the economy. All of that, that whole consensus, again, if Trump wins, is going to just get sort of chucked out the window. So I think one of the major things to look for in this election is not only who wins, but depending on who wins, whether the party of Lincoln, which the Republican Party is, has actually reached the end of its moment. They change slowly in the United States, but parties do change. Oh, Hillary Clinton. Wow, now there's a resume. I think if Mrs. Clinton were applying to be a Canterbury Fellow, <laughs> she would be um, accepted, no question. I mean, it glitters. So what's the Hillary problem? What's that about? Bernie Sanders has endorsed Hillary Clinton. But the problem, again, she's got formidable political talents. And I do take the argument that some feminists have made that any man, and you probably wouldn't want to use the term first lady, but any man who had this resume, he wouldn't even come up. It would just be a no-brainer that he, you know, would be the presumptive nominee. But if you've been following it, there's that, fair or not, there's that problem with the Clintons where no one seems able, even the supporters, to quite shape that notion that they keep getting away with things that other people wouldn't get away with. And I don't know how many of you followed the server controversy, but it was fascinating to watch the director of the FBI sort of dance around the subject 
of her culpability with respect to the emails. Now, I, my personal opinion is that rightfully so, the FBI director declined to re recommend prosecution. It did not reach the level by which you would bring a criminal indictment. There was no conspiracy. There was no intent to defraud the American people or the government. But look at what he did say. And this is for a woman who wants to be president of the United States. We do assess that hostile actors gained access to private commercial email accounts of people with whom Secretary Clinton was in regular contact. There is evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very <coughs> sensitive, highly classified information. And the State Department in this time frame was generally lacking in the kind of care for classified information found elsewhere in the government. <coughs> so again, you've, one of the issues here with this candidacy is that Trump has <coughs> very high negative ratings. But as you'll see a slide here in the moment, really Hillary Clinton's ratings are not that much better than his. This is such a tense moment in the United States. It's such an important election. And some are starting to notice and argue that we have two of the most, in the terminology, <coughs> negatively loaded candidates in a generation or more. And if you've been following the news today, I know I've got some students in here. Someone tell me what the big news is about the Democratic National Convention. <laughs> yes. Again, it's that you never quite pin the Clintons down. But we've been living with this since Bill Clinton became president in 1992. The carelessness, the idea that the rules don't quite apply, the obfuscation, or at least that's the perception of many Americans, including some of Hillary's supporters. They admit, no, she is not a perfect candidate. What has recently happened? What has broken this week? And remember, the conventions in this case are about, you know, you're, a lot of people have already locked in. They're either not going to vote, they're going to vote for Trump, or they're going to vote for Clinton. End of story. And they're not going to change, no matter what happens <laughs> over the next several months. But you've got to reach those people, and you want to put that face on the candidate. You want to humanize them. You want to make them connect with the American people. But what's broken today is WikiLeaks has released a cache of emails which shows that over a two-year time period, the Democratic National Committee in emails openly discussing favoritism towards Hillary Clinton's bid for the presidency. They very clearly, this isn't just a media or a Republican Party beat up, they suggest very clearly to the point that Deborah Washerman Schultz has had to resign as the Democratic National Committee Chair. She's been replaced by Donna Brazile. And it shows very clearly, again, you've got two examples here. One of the emails discusses deliberately <coughs> placing negative articles in newspapers around the country about Sanders and his supporters. They're radicals, <coughs> they're, this, they're that. Another one discusses whether raising the question of atheism, Sanders purported atheism, particularly in the Southern and the Midwestern states, could harm him in key states. So you have a convention opening where there's already a great deal of scandal. And ironically, and I'm sure that Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton are wondering how this could have happened, for all the inflammatory things that Donald Trump has said, he said in May 2016, the system is rigged and they're working against Bernie Sanders. And he was kind of right about that. So the candidates then, quite an interesting moment. Two highly negative candidates in terms of public polling. You've got a scandal on the eve of the Democratic National Convention. And all of this then, here's one of those things that many of you may disagree with me on. If you had told me a year ago that I would be paying even the smallest amount of attention <laughs> to a third party candidate, I would have told you you were nuts. Pa, third parties. They don't matter. It's either the Democrats or the Republicans. 
I'm ready for the backlash here. I know we tend to think of them as pot-smoking free marketeers. But I'm actually, my personal view, which I don't mind putting out there as we get closer to the election, is now I'm starting to look at Gary Johnson. Does anybody know who he is? He's the libertarian candidate for president of the United States. He is already on all 50 ballots. He was governor of New Mexico. He's running with Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts, a liberal Republican. And he's polling approximately 15% of the American public. The question for Johnson, the first question, is can we get him on the debate stage? In order to get on the debate stage, the presidential debates, there's a commission that regulates that. <coughs> and you have to poll 15% or more in five recognized national polls. He's almost there. The sting in the tail is that only one of the polls specifically mentions it. The other four polls, blank. So you have to be pretty politically switched on to even know to write his name in. But he does seem to be reaching the 15% threshold. In any other election, I would say, ah, whatever. You know, it's just going to be flavor of the month, and it's not going to make any difference. But as I'm going to talk about in a moment with the plausible scenarios, the way the US system is set up in this election, Having a third party candidate could make a huge difference. So to summarize, strange election, highly negatively rated candidates, a scandal opening on the eve of the Democratic National Convention. But if we go back to the founders of the United States, they sort of predicted this. And I think it's kind of interesting to realize that George Washington said this in the late 1700s. Political parties, bottom line, become the means by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be able to subvert the power of the people. <laughs> and at the risk of making myself a bit unpopular in this room, I am going to say something nice about Donald Trump. But I also include Bernie Sanders in this. As volatile as this election has been, as many concerns as I personally have about the direction that the United States is going, I am beginning to think, as this plays on, that it was a necessary election. And I think that both Trump and Sanders have done the United States a very great service. Political scientists have been saying for years that the two-party system is bankrupt. It has been locked in. It is not responsive to the people. But it's taken two actual candidacies coming in from the left and the right and trying to break open those established elitist institutions that have brought forward so many of these problems. So again, I would credit both Trump and Sanders with that. I don't know if that was their intent. I sometimes think that Donald Trump got into this for a lark and is as surprised as we are that he's done as well as he has. I mean, can you imagine kind of getting into it for just sort of, oh, it'll be fun, or I'll get my picture in the paper, or I'll get to have some influence on the platform, and then become the presumptive nominee? I mean, right, so one does wonder. But again, this has been a theme throughout American politics since the founding of the United States. Political parties were not well received by many of the founders, the original writers of the Constitution, and I think there's some wisdom there, because I do think, however it plays out, whoever wins, that if the parties don't realize that they have got to become more responsive to the rank and file, then we will continue to have these problems and we will continue to have these eruptions from the left and these eruptions from the right. Okay, one other thing I want to say about Gary Johnson, again, never would have thought I would have looked at a third party candidate, but I'm not, going to tell, I'm not sure yet who I'm going to vote for, if it matters, but his slogan, make America sane, Again, <laughs> he pretty much had me at hello with that one. Um, I thought that was really good. I continue to think that's very good. And that is one of his um, talking points. He has also said, as someone who's been smoking pot since he was in his 20s and advocates the decriminalization of marijuana, 
that he will forswear both pot and alcohol if he is in fact elected president because, quote, no one wants a stoner answering the red phone in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, you just keep bringing it, Mr. Johnson, um, you know, Governor Johnson, I, I like that point of view. Okay. Oh, wow, this is where, I'm actually going to try and do the Electoral College in five minutes. Because it's a strange institution. It's a very American thing. And it can get quite complicated. We are going to breeze through this because you need a little bit of understanding for the scenarios and their potential effect to make sense. But the rules of the game matter. And the thing you have to remember about this election, I think the easiest way to put it, is it's basically as if there's going to be 50 presidential elections going on one in every state, then you will add those results up to get the winner. So the first step that matters is at the state level. And what you pick up when you win a state are those state's electoral college votes. Now, forget for the moment that there are actual people behind all these terms. It's kind of easier to think about it as two teams. Team Blue and Team Red. And they're competing for a total, the game, and I mean that seriously in the political science sense of game, with high stakes. Every one of those states has a certain number of points, AKA electoral college votes. You get them from your number of representatives plus your two senators, and we put in three for Washington, D.C., so they're represented. There's 538 points on the board that Team A and Team B, Team Blue, Team Red are competing for. And every time you knock off a state, because it's a winner-take-all system, there's two exceptions, but we won't go into that. There's always exceptions in the US. But basically, it's a winner-take-all system. So if you win the state of California with its 55 electoral college votes, you could win that by one person and you get 55 points in your call. The first person to reach half plus one, a true majority, which is 270 points, is going to be president of the United States. So, what does that tell you? Why does that matter? Well, that's gonna structure a whole bunch of things on the 8th of November, particularly in an election that if it continues to track this close is almost unpredictable. It is possible, as we saw in 2000, for a candidate to win the popular vote but lose the electoral college. And if they lose the electoral college, they're not going to be president. That almost broke the country when it was Al Gore and George Bush. Can you imagine if Hillary Clinton, say, wins the popular vote but Donald Trump gets the electoral college? Or vice versa? We got through it before, we have gotten through it before. But again, this election is so volatile and that is one possibility. Another possibility, which, and I don't say this to be pejorative, most Americans haven't needed to know it for over a century. But the Constitution says that if no one gets to 270, the incoming house will choose the president, and the incoming Senate will choose the vice president. <laughs> this is why Gary Johnson's got them scared. <coughs> Gary Johnson is from New Mexico, which according to this, slightly dated, but it has about five electoral college votes. Weld is from Massachusetts, which has approximately 11. They're not gonna probably win the presidency in terms of popular vote. But if they can prevent both Trump and Clinton, if they can win one or two states and make it impossible for anybody to get a true majority, it gets kicked into the House, it gets kicked into the Senate, and we won't know the answer until January 6th. We'll be in some sort of presidential limbo. I'm not sure how America would handle that. And in this election, it is a much more serious possibility than I personally have seen it in elections in this generation. 
Another issue with the Electoral College, as you see here, if California gives its 55 Electoral College votes to Donald Trump, I will take everyone in here out to dinner. <laughs> and I've even said that on tape. My point, there are certain states going into this election that they know they can count on. The current estimate from a wonderful site called 270 to Win, which is a great site to look at if you want to follow this election. They do updates every day. Great statisticians, political prognosticators. Is that as of today, Clinton's got 270 points before this thing starts. Because there are certain states that you can predict are going to go for Clinton, the Democratic Party ticket. California being one of them. Maybe probably Massachusetts. New York will be interesting, given that they're both New Yorkers. But she can count on 217. Trump at the moment can count on about 191. I am from the state of Tennessee. I will make the same promise. If the state of Tennessee puts their votes behind Hillary Clinton, I would absolutely just fall off my chair on election night. I can't see it. The South is going to go unless Virginia goes Democratic, but most of the Deep South in particular, and I just got very Southern when I said that, the Deep South, most of the Deep South is going to go for Trump. He can rely on those states. What this means when we get to election night, if you're interested in watching it, is you're going to have to focus on key battleground states. And in this election, it will likely be Ohio, Pennsylvania. So do we think it's any accident that the conventions have been in Cleveland and Philadelphia? No, I don't think so. They've been predicting this for a long time. Florida. There's a few others. But it's going to come down to about six or seven states that are very close as we speak. They are too close for even the best statisticians and prognosticators in D.C. to feel comfortable telling you. They might tell you it's leaning this way, but they are going to be too close to call. Look at those numbers. This is from Real Clear Politics, who also does some fantastic polling. And this is from the American 24th of July. Clinton, 44.6. Trump, 42.3. Now, I'm not a statistician, but that means we have no idea who's going to win this. <laughs> right? I mean, there's the margin of error question, and these are both well within. We don't know. And the other thing I notice about these is when I add that up, I get about 86.9. <laughs> Where's that other 13 to 14% gone? Presumably, they're in the haven't decided, don't know, Gary Johnson camp. That's a lot of people at this stage in the game who are in the undecided column, if you will. And look at three of the key states. Pennsylvania, again, within the margin of error, much too close to call, leaning Democrat, but you can't know. Wow, is it going to come down to Florida again? That's where Bush and Gore had their reckoning. And that's another thing I want to say and am quite serious about. There's so many scenarios here. It may be, it may be that someone will eke out a clear win. They will get the popular vote and that will translate into a clear electoral college victory and we can all go rest after this incredible election season. But it is increasingly becoming possible, particularly as people like Jeb Bush become much more open about their desire for a third candidate, that you could end up with no one getting a majority, it gets bumped to the House and the Senate, and that would be two months of not knowing, which again has not happened in such a long time, and I'm not sure that all Americans even know that that is what happens. You can also get a situation a la Florida. If there, it is so close that if there is one district where someone can make a plausible claim that they were prevented from legally voting, you're bumping it into recount territory. Right. So again, we don't know, 
But I do think this will be a fascinating evening to watch these election terms come in because, again, it's going to come down to some very key states. Those states are very close. And I would not be surprised if the most anodyne scenario is we have to go into recounts, that we will not know when the polls close on the 8th of November because it's just that close. All right, so to wrap up then, this is a question I've been getting a lot. It is an interesting question. What does it mean for the world? What does it mean for New Zealand? Almost I'm tempted to ask what you think it would mean, but I might just get this <laughs> flurry of intense opinions. Um, let me tell you what I think at the moment, and then we'll finish up and have the question and answer session. Okay, Barack Obama. President number 44. It has been a significant change. He has been a transitional president. We are now well out of the Cold War and we are well out of the post-Cold War period. I think we need a new name for where we are now. Look at some of the visits he's made. He went to Cuba. Those of you who remember American politics in the Cold War, we, haven't, we have had our foot on the neck of Cuba's economy since about 1961. No visits, no travel. The President of the United States went to Cuba. That was a very big deal. He went to Vietnam and was received with incredible enthusiasm. So President Obama, you think about Cuba, you think about Vietnam, you think about the treaty with Iran. You think about the subtle shift in America's relationship with Israel. If Hillary Clinton is elected, I think in some respects she will be more assertive, perhaps, than President Obama. I think she is more of an interventionist, my estimation of her. But I think you will see a continuation of this legacy, this opening up, this moving away from these established you know, strictures that now are so outdated. We're so far past that. If Trump is elected, I think we have to think both in terms of the short and the medium term, as well as the long term. I will say again, uh, this election, I have even had people in the grocery store checkout line ask me if I think, quote, that lunatic's going to win. <laughs> right, I mean, I'll be at New World, and they'll hear my accent, and they'll go, do you really think Trump can win this? I mean, you know, come on, America, you've lost your mind. Right? I mean, we always had our concerns about you here in New Zealand, but you've really, really gone over the edge this time. Well, in this, and I'm sure there are people who will disagree with me strongly about this, Trump getting elected is going to really shake things up. <laughs> and not necessarily in a good way. Again, his style is not one that translates well, I don't think, either here or certainly in Western Europe. He has said he wants to revisit the US-South Korean security <laughs> arrangement, which caused quite a few phone calls to President Obama. He's recently said that he's going to review every single NATO partner. And if they're not meeting their 2% of GDP threshold, they might just not be part of it anymore. To even say these things in the realm of diplomacy is to upset a lot of people. I think it's difficult to know whether that's calculated or if that's just who he is. Would he moderate? I don't know. I don't know if Trump himself will. I am a bit concerned, not because I want to endorse any one of the candidates. I am a bit concerned, though, that passions are running so high with this election that I'm hearing people say things, you know, some jokingly, but some quite seriously, that he's the next Mussolini <laughs> or he's the next Hitler. And maybe I'm still too innocent, even after all these years, but. I do want to believe that the system will exert a moderating effect. Yes, I understand, I think, why so many of our allies, let alone countries that are less friendly to the United States, find Trump troublesome. But remember, we're going to have midterm elections in 2018. 
If Trump is every horrible thing that we've heard that he is, you would probably see every, most, most Republicans getting turfed out. You've got a Supreme Court. You've got 50 state governments. You've got the fact that treaties have to go through the Senate. I'm not saying it would be an easy ride. It would be very different. Again, the choice between Trump and Clinton is a real choice. It is a real choice this time, and I think it's going to be a fascinating reflection on America over the next 20 to 30 years. Having said that, I do think some of the rhetoric might be getting just a bit over the top, because I would like to believe that the system itself will put a break on the kind of radical change that is troubling so many people, both in the United States and abroad. The last thing I will say, well, two last things. Another issue the United States is facing, of course, is its debt, and we don't want to talk about that. President Obama inherited a very rocky economy. He had to deal to the 2008 economic meltdown, and he wanted to bring Obamacare, some form of health care, to more Americans. Having said that, look at these numbers. That's not eight billion, that's eight trillion. And it's, that's how much it's increased just under President Obama. President George Bush wasn't much better, to be fair to Obama. What this means is that on the one hand, the United States seeks to project its interests, particularly in the Asia Pacific, but its ability to do so is increasingly constrained by this staggering amount of debt. Having said that, my last point on foreign policy, another thing that I think will track in the long term, Clinton or Trump will matter, they will matter, and a lot of our allies, let alone less friendly countries, will not be happy if Donald Trump is who they have to work with, or at least the Donald Trump we know right now. In the long term, another major shift in the Obama administration has been what they call the Asia-Pacific pivot. We know that this is the region that will likely have the most economic growth, that will likely have the most population growth. We also know that China and the Philippines have recently had a very intense debate over the South China Sea. Vietnam has claims, Malaysia has claims. I think the long-term profile, whether it's Clinton or Trump, or possibly a third-party <coughs> candidate, will nevertheless be that this shift to Asia Pacific will be a foreign policy reality <coughs> that is going to affect any new president. It goes beyond any individual president. So I want to leave you with two quotes, one of them it's sad. This is William Butler Yeats from 1919, The Second Coming, and I keep thinking about it. My, some of my students have heard this already. I just keep coming back to this moment. The center isn't holding. America has always prided itself, rightly or wrongly, on being a basically non-ideological. We've got a basic faith in our Constitution. There's a real mainstream consensus. That seems to be Shredding. And I keep coming back to Yates. The best like all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I was giving this talk to a group downtown, and one woman just blurted out, a Kiwi, oh, well, that's Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, maybe. I can see that. But again, my faith in the institutions, I want to end on a cautious note of optimism, so I'm going to end with Winston Churchill, who, if he didn't say this, should have. <laughs> you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other possibility. So I think I'll let him have the last word on that. And we'll